The world didn't end with an all-consuming nuclear war as many people feared it would. That might have been better than what actually happened. At least with the nuclear war, there was hope, a very slim hope, of survival. I fear there is no surviving this, though. In the upper echelons of the government, the people in charge of making life and death decisions thought it was a wiser course of action to use bioweapons. Don't poison the earth, just the people. And that was the propaganda they poured out to the public here in the US. And once the threats of a bio attack were in the news here, other countries joined, threatening the use of their own bioweapons. Widespread panic engulfed the world, and protests popped up everywhere in every town. It was the most united I had ever seen the citizens of the US, and I was proud to be among the protesters, making my opinion heard. In those crowds of like-minded people, one voice could be multiplied until the sentiment was heard worldwide, and the news coverage was constant. And like many others, I really believe the government was listening to us, not just here but in all the other countries too. The threats of war were slowly and reluctantly replaced with truces, treaties were created, new documents signed into law, and a hush fell over the land about bio-attacks. As the representatives of different governments pandered to the public, told us what we wanted to hear, we were persuaded to stop the protests and go back to life as usual. Had I looked more closely at those televised handshake sessions, I might have seen the lie in their eyes. I might have been more prepared. But I didn't see the lies, and I, like the rest of the population, was not prepared. Now the bio-attack came to fruition over several months, as the various viral outbreaks made people sick and eventually killed almost all the victims. And by the time I realized that the bio-war had taken place, it was far too late to help most people. In my town, a new strain of flu quickly became an epidemic. We heard the warnings on TV one day, and two days later, businesses, schools, and public works were shut down, and the place looked like a ghost town. After a few days of sitting at home, waiting for the flu epidemic to clear up in my town, I finally started calling neighbors, friends, and family. To my horror, Every person that answered the phone that day reported at least one death in their circle of friends and family. Many of the people I called didn't even answer their phones, so I left messages and waited a day before I started to panic. I started packing a go bag. I didn't know exactly where I would go. The viruses were everywhere, hoping against hope that the sickness would start to clear up. I remained at home a few more days. I stopped seeing any movement from my neighbors' houses. No animals, no people. And only a few birds remained. The news reporters were even showing signs of illness, but they still worked to give us the latest reports about what was going on in the world. On the seventh day after the new flu shut down my town, I watched the news. Bella Morley pretty little blonde who gave the weather forecast with a big smile every day, collapsed between the New York City and the Atlantic City forecast. And that's the day I decided to get to my family's property, a hundred miles away. The news reports I had watched in the previous days had all advised the public to remain in their homes, and I had done that. I didn't want to be around anyone with the flu and risk getting sick, but... After Bella dropped on set, I knew this was much worse than anything that had ever happened before. I loaded everything I thought I might need into my truck and then secured a tarp over it all. And as I went back inside for my last pack, my cell phone rang. I'd not been able to use my phone for the last 24 hours, but it turned out to be my buddy Ryan. He and I graduated from the same college as engineers the year before. He asked if I was sick and I told him no. He wasn't sick either, but said that everyone in the suburbs where he lived was dead, including all their pets. 
He hadn't been able to get a hold of his family, who lived in the same general direction as mine, and I told him to come over and we would go together, stopping at his parents' house first. I put the TV back on the news station and sat with a beer, watching as the local anchor coughed and constantly dabbed at his forehead with the handkerchief. He kept apologizing, and after 15 minutes, I realized there had been no commercial breaks. After a half an hour of no commercials, Bob, the anchor man, cleared his throat and said, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but there is no one left alive here. I'm the last. I'm dying too. I can feel it. If you're watching this, find a place where the viruses can't travel and stay there. I'm going home now. I don't want to go out like Bella in front of the cameras. Good luck and God bless. With that, he stood and staggered off camera, and I was left staring at his empty seat as it spun on its swivel for several seconds. Then there was nothing but the empty news desk and chairs. I switched channels and found that only channels that had pre-programming were still on the air. No news, nothing live... The streaming internet channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all the other social media sites were eerily silent and still. It was as creepy to me as being in a school at night when no one was there. There were places where there was supposed to be activity, people, drama, and there was nothing. Ryan arrived on foot. He told me that the roads were crammed with vehicles and bodies. He was pale and glassy-eyed as he told me of his journey to my house. As we left, we quickly ran into one of the roads blocked by vehicles. Neither of us got out to examine the few bodies we saw on the sidewalks and in cars. And fear that my family might be dead turned into terror as I maneuvered off the road and onto the rougher terrain of the land. I drove through yards with gut-wrenching feeling of guilt. I mean, you're not supposed to drive through people's yards, it's just wrong. But I soon realized that nothing would ever be normal again. Ever. Outside town limits, I was able to get back on the road. It was a tune lane that twisted and turned, slowing our progress. At the bottom of the mountain lay another town, and I stopped at the convenience store for gas. The store was open, but... There were no people present. I asked Ryan to go in with me and we both entered, expecting to find bodies littering the floor. There was nothing. The radio was on behind the counter and there was no music, only static. I turned on the gas pump and Ryan carried cases of water to the truck. The whole time we were there, he carried things he thought we might need and kept telling me that this was the end. Everyone was dead. He worked himself into a frenzy quite honestly, got on my nerves. I wanted to fill my gas tank and get out of there. I didn't want to think about the possible end of the world. Getting control of himself, Ryan finally quieted. He sat silently staring out at the road as I drove away, and Ryan flipped the radio on. Static blared out of the speakers. There were no stations on air. He pulled out a cell phone, held it up, and stuck it out the window, pulled it in close, and then told me that there was no signal. I checked my phone, it was the same. And as we neared the end of the town, we began to see more and more vehicles on the road, and I had to swerve off the side and drive through a large field. I didn't see any people inside the cars or lying around, as I had in my town. And the road in this part of the new town was not like the main street in my town where businesses lined each side. The road stretched through an empty landscape, devoid of houses and buildings for a couple of miles. Ryan, where do you think they all went? He shook his head and shrugged without speaking. The absence of bodies bothered me worse than seeing the corpses. At least when I saw the corpses, it was obvious that people had died in their cars leaving the road blocked. If people were sick enough to be dying suddenly like that, then where were their bodies? 
The nearest hospital or clinic was at least two miles away. If they were so sick, they wouldn't have been able to walk there. But if they were dead, where were the bodies? We continued to the neighborhood where Ryan's family lived. As I drove, I had to maneuver up onto sidewalks and avoid random cars. And again, there still weren't any bodies. We had seen no animals either, and it felt as if we were inside an episode of the Twilight Zone. I parked in the driveway outside the Henderson's house and looked at Ryan, and I asked if he wanted me to go in with him, and he nodded. I didn't want to go into the house. Hell, I didn't want to get out of the truck. And as we walked toward the front door, I caught movement out of the corner of my eye and grabbed Ryan's arm to stop him. I pointed toward the backyard. There was a young girl ambling away from us. Her hair was straggly, her dress was dirty, and her hands looked to be coated in filth. Ryan moved toward the open gate tried to stop him, but he pulled free and continued. He spoke to the girl, calling her Caroline, and I knew this to be the name of his only niece. As she turned to face us, my heart fell into my knees. Her face was gray, eyes black, and blood was smeared across her cheek where it was starting to dry. She snarled like an animal at Ryan, and he stood there, eyes big mouth hanging open. I bolted for the open gate, pushing Ryan out of the way as I pulled it shut just before the little girl hit it, thrashing and growling, reaching towards him. Ryan didn't want to leave Caroline there, but I got him to see that something was very wrong with her. We just couldn't pick her up and carry her out of there. And Caroline continued to scream and thrash at the fence, and I hurried Ryan onto the porch and into the house. At first, nothing seemed out of the ordinary inside. Then, we went to his parents' bedroom. His father lay sprawled on his back on the floor. His throat had been ripped out. His face was twisted into a visage of terror and pain. In one fist, he had a strip of ripped cloth with a distinct paisley pattern on it. The blood and viscera was on the floor, bed the bottom of the closet wall, and even the bottom drawer of the dresser across the room. Ryan cried out at the sight of his father. God, it was such a terrible sound, so full of grief that it tore at my heart. I pulled the quilt from the bed and laid it over Mr. Henderson's body. I pulled Ryan to his feet, telling him we needed to get the hell out of there. In the hallway, still trying to quiet Ryan, I saw the most horrible thing I'd seen so far. Mrs. Henderson, dressed in a heavily soiled paisley print dress. And she stepped out of Ryan's old room. Her face was gray and her eyes were black, just like little Caroline. She was gnawing on a small arm. And part of her cheek had been torn away, but that didn't seem to faze her or slow down her ripping the flesh of the severed arm. A large piece of her dress was missing at the bottom. She didn't scream or growl when she saw us. Instead, she dropped the arm to the carpet and began to advance slowly, a piece of bloody flesh dangling from her mouth as she continued to chew. I understood that Mrs. Henderson had probably killed everyone else in the house, and I had no desire to look into more rooms. Ryan was useless, standing silent and staring at his mother, or what had once been his mother. She moved closer and reached out for Ryan. The hallway was skinny, but I yanked Ryan away from those reaching fingers and stepped in front of him. And out of sheer panic and not knowing what else to do, I shoved Mrs. Henderson into the room where her dead husband lay, and I slammed the door shut. I yelled at Ryan to get back to the truck and I followed closely as he ran out of the house. And briefly looking back, in the backyard, I saw that Caroline had been back to shuffling idly through the grass. Our next stop was the police station. 
We had hoped to find a CB radio to use so we could find out if there were others alive in the surrounding area. Unfortunately, there was nothing left but a burnt out husk of a station, and in the ruins we saw a couple of burned bodies. Ryan asked me not to stop to investigate, so we continued to my parents' home a few miles away. Although the house was only a few miles away, the drive was long and I had time to consider what I would do if my family had suffered the same fate as Ryan's. I knew how I hoped I would react, but I was realistic enough to know I couldn't be certain. The house finally came into view, and the first thing I saw was the shattered picture window of the living room. A white curtain shear flapped out of that window like a white flag of surrender in the strong breeze. My father passed the broken window as I pulled up close. He was dragging something past the sofa. I saw a foot in his hand, and I didn't need to go inside to know that he had probably killed my mother. He looked like Ryan's mother had looked. I didn't even stop in there. I just turned around and sped out of the driveway, biting back the sobs. About ten miles away from there, we found a deserted shopping center and parked in the center of the paved lot. I had to figure out the next step. Ryan and I bounced ideas off each other for a few minutes. We decided that we could climb to the top of the shopping center and enter through the service crawl space. At least we'd be safe inside. And there would be enough food for however long we might stay. You think this is how it is? Is this how the world ends? Ryan asked as we broke into the service crawl space. Nah, there has to be others. We're alive, so I'm sure others are too. We just have to figure out how to find them. I headed in first, and Ryan followed. What about those... Those... You know... The thing my mother turned into. Ryan dropped from the crawl space down into a long silver table in the kitchen, and we walked into a food court. Zombies, Ryan. Might as well call it what it is. No matter what caused them to turn... They're zombies. I didn't like using the word either, but there it was. No other word fit. We spent a total of three days in the shopping center, neither of us knowing what to do next. I think I had half-assed hope that the situation was just going to disappear on its own, or maybe that others like us would just pop up and we, as a group, could band together and figure it out. On the fourth day, I realized that we had to establish some form of communication with the wider world. I told Ryan my thoughts. I had grown up in the general area and knew there was an isolated radio station at the base of a mountain nearby. No radio stations played any music. Only static. If we could get to the radio station, we could go live and maybe someone would hear us. And at first... Ryan was completely against the idea of leaving the safety of the store, and I told him that it was unlikely that others would come by. No one had so far, and the only living people who hadn't turned into monsters had become food for the monsters. It took some persuasion, but he agreed to go with me, help me restore some form of communication so we could figure out what we should do next. We found keys at the security office and didn't have to break any glass to get out. If things got worse, we could always come back, and it would still be safe. About two miles from the radio station, I had to go off-road to proceed again. And this time, there were a few bodies, but they looked as if they'd been torn to shreds. Arms and legs lay strewn on the roadway and in the grass. I saw a woman's head lying against the back tire of an old Chevy. My stomach turned and I forced myself to look away. Now about halfway across the field, I hit a ravine that was hidden by the tall grass. The jolt was so hard that it threw me into the steering wheel, busting my lip. It was as if the world had dropped out from under us. The engine stalled and wouldn't start up again. We got out and saw that both front tires were flat, and a long, sharp rock formation had struck through the middle of my radiator. With no way to fix the radiator, we just started walking. 
Let me tell you, it was scary that we were so close to all those mangled bodies, and the sun was scorching us as we walked, and within ten minutes we saw a movement to our left, far over in the shady woods. We called out, thinking it was probably other survivors walking off the mountain, even after the small group emerged and started towards us in the sunlight. We thought they were survivors. By the time we realized that they were zombies, they were a couple hundred feet from us, and they were moving fast. Not the shambling monsters from the movies. Ryan dropped his pack and broke into a run. I followed. We ran until we had outdistanced the monsters by several hundred feet, and they seemed to lose track of us. Maybe they were guided by their sense of smell or hearing. I didn't know. I still don't. There was a small patch of woods separating where we were in the field to where the radio station sat. The shade felt good after the blistering heat of running in the open field. We thought we could slow down and catch our breath for a few minutes, but we were wrong. Just as the virus didn't kill every infected person, it didn't kill all the exposed animals either. As Ryan and I walked into the forested area, we heard growling and we stopped. A deer stalked out of the shadows. We knew it had changed. Its dark eyes pierced my soul, and the doe's face was covered with blood. Pieces of gore and hair were stuck to its front hooves. Something larger trampled in the forest debris behind the deer. The deer didn't seem to notice and walked towards us, growling low. I told Ryan to run, and we headed to the right with the deer gaining on us easily. Ryan fell, and I tried to drag him to safety. But the deer was on us, slashing at us with its hooves. I tried to hit it with my pack, but the blows didn't hurt it or alter its attack on us. And the deer hit Ryan across the forearm, cutting him to the bone. Ryan's scream was bone-chilling, and the deer snapped its jaws as it dipped its head toward the bloody arm. And all of a sudden, the deer flew to the side in a blur of black fur before it could latch its teeth onto Ryan's arm. The black bear that downed the deer ripped into the animal with a ferocity that I'd never seen before. Ryan scrambled to his feet and ran, and I lit out of those woods faster than I'd ever ran before. The sounds of the vicious attack behind me. We cleared the field in record time and were exhausted by the time the radio station came into view. I immediately took off my shirt and told Ryan to wrap his arm with it, and he wrapped it as we walked to the radio station. The radio station was a short, squat, one-story brick building that had mostly been taken over by the Virginia Creeper Vines. The radio station was a short, squat, one-story brick building that had mostly been taken over by Virginia Creeper Vines. The entrance door was partially hidden behind the vine, and I was more than willing to endure the itchy, burning rash to get inside the building, safely away from the zombie animals and the people outside. As I reached for the door handle, the vines closest to me moved toward my hand. Startled, I jumped back, expecting some zombie bird or squirrel to emerge and attack me. No animal leaped from the foliage, and I reached for the door again. A wide swath of the vine moved toward my hand. Ryan and I checked for another entrance and found only one more door was completely covered in the vines. The windows were also inaccessible. Ryan said, Well, it is just a vine. It can't be that tough to tear through and, well, it doesn't have any teeth. And I agreed with him. I reached for the door handle again and immediately... The vine snapped around my hand and arm and started spiraling up around my torso. Ryan began ripping them away, and I yanked the door open and darted inside. Ryan slammed the door shut behind us. After cleaning and dressing Ryan's maimed arm, we set to work restoring communication capabilities in the station. For a couple of educated engineers, we might not have much knowledge and skill against the zombie apocalypse but we had made short work of putting the radio station back to rights and sending out messages across every local channel. We will have the means to send messages further in a day or so, and hopefully 
There are others who survived and are unaffected by the viral outbreak. And they can hear our messages and perhaps answer. But our problems are far from over. We need food and water. Our supplies are minimal and won't last us a week. The truck is two miles away. And I really don't think we can make it back to the supplies safely. We won't lose hope though. <laughs> we can't. It's all we have left. <laughs>